from Bad Influence. Oh, oh. Sorry, the latest super console, the PlayStation, is released oh. on Friday. We'll give you a full rundown on the machine, including this great new skateboard controller, which I suggest you use instead of the real thing, Andy. No, oh, I'm definitely getting it, Sonny. I'm definitely getting it. Our main review is one of the launch games, Wipeout. And as if that wasn't dangerous enough, we'll be looking at ways to personalise Doom to create your own version of the ever-popular shooter map. Oh, on a computer, Andy, on a computer. And our games expert, Violet Berlin visits the birthplace of the first ever video game. But first, on Friday, you'll finally be able to get your hands on the PlayStation. Yes, 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 yes. Never mind the hype. We know it's the latest super console to be released in the United Kingdom, but what do you actually get for your 300 pounds? Well, the good news is that you'll get one of the most compact consoles around. It's about half the size of the bulky Saturn, and it's 100 pounds cheaper. You will get one of these stylish controllers. In fact, the UK joypads are going to be 18% bigger than their Japanese equivalents. Perhaps we have larger hands over here. You'll get all the leads and all the packing and all the periphery, but, um, ah, you won't actually get any games. The PlayStation does come with a demo disc, which contains one playable level of our main review this week, Wipeout, and a couple of other demos, but nothing else. So to whet your appetite, we've rounded up three of the funkiest games you've never seen that'll be out later this year. This one's called Warhawk. It's a flight sim where you enter into ferocious air-to-air -air and air-to-ground skirmishes with all the latest high-tech weaponry in fully rendered 3D environments. But if you prefer your feet to stay on the ground, hack your way through one of the most detailed worlds ever created by a computer in Loaded. When it's finished, this game's gore rating may only be surpassed by the body count. No console lineup is complete without a football game, and actual soccer is one of the most realistic ever. Real footballers' movements were incorporated into the game, and the resulting animation is totally lifelike. But the best thing about the PlayStation will be all the funky peripherals that you'll be able to plug into it. Things like this giant skateboard, which works with a disc called Extreme Games. In it, players can roll a skate, roll a blade, roll anything, really, in a frantic dash to the finish. This is Andrea who's going to demonstrate it for us. To make her character go forward, she stands right on the front of the board. And to make her character jump up or do tricks, she can kick the fishtail at the back. And then to steer is like a real board. You rock the board to the left or to the right. So, what do you think? I think it's a really good game. It's a lot harder to steer than a normal skateboard, but you've got the advantage that you're not going to fall off. Which means it's a good one for me. Come on. I was born to skate. Yes! Whoa! Born to skate. Whoa. The gnarly Andy Crane there. This week's main review is one of the first games available for the PlayStation, Wipeout. The game puts you at the controls of a hovering futuristic racecraft. It's a race to the finish against seven opponents, and the best way to get ahead is to shoot them. If you get bored of playing on your own and you know someone with another PlayStation, there is always a two-player link-up mode. But is Wipeout a race leader? Not Here's Adam. This game is very fast and has incredible graphics, but when you first start, you'll probably spend too much time crashing to notice. The game has a choice of six tracks in six countries, and you can also choose from four vehicles and eight drivers. An important part of the game is to pick up power-up icons, such as missiles, which will slow down enemies which will run. Mines to slow down enemies from behind. Speed ups to allow you to turbo boost along the track. And shields like the vehicle in front just use to protect yourself from attack. When you first start playing this game, the steering is very hard and you will wobble all over the place. But with practice, you'll soon get very good. One thing console owners won't be used to is the amount of time that this game takes to load off a CD. This is a very fast and stylish game. The main thing I didn't like was that you do need two PlayStations for the two-player option, but overall it's very enjoyable. The graphics were amazing, and the speed of the game made it really exciting, although I did find it quite difficult to control at first. The graphics are amazing, but I'd expect that from a Super Console, but the gameplay isn't that incredible. And the scores then, not a complete wipeout, an average three from the boys and four from the girls. So the boys give Wipeout an average three, which goes to prove what we always say. It's the gameplay that counts, not shiny graphics. That was particularly true in the early days of computing, when the hardware wasn't capable of producing anything more than basic blobs on a screen. Here's Violet in a pilgrimage to the birthplace of video games, Silicon Valley in California. Everything has to start somewhere, no matter how big it gets in the end. The computer and video game industry is now worth billions of dollars. But this is where it all started. This is the Dutch Goose Tavern in Palo Alto, California. 
and it was here 22 years ago that a young guy called Nolan Bushnell walked in with a proposition. He asked the owner if he could install a brand new kind of game, a shoot 'em up called Computer Space, which just happened to be the world's first video game. Back in the early 1970s, it was pinball that was a game to play, and it was a pinball player that Nolan thought would want to play his new game. But even though Computer Space was pretty basic by today's standards, the pinball wizards just couldn't get the hang of his newfangled video game. Nolan was way ahead of his time, and the game bombed. Nolan wasn't put off, and he set up a workshop in his daughter's bedroom. He vowed that his next game would be so simple a monkey could play it. And instead of building 500, he just built one. This time, he decided to test out his game first before going into production. He used this place, which used to be a bar called Andy Cat's Tavern. The game he invented was called Pong, a kind of tennis game played with a square ball. But after only one weekend, disaster struck. Nolan got a call to say his Pong machine had broken down. He drove over to Andy Cat's Tavern, desolate, wondering if he'd ever make a successful machine. But when he opened the cabinet up, he could see the fault straight away. The primitive coin mechanism had completely worn out, and the entire cabinet was totally flooded with quarters. Eventually, there was a Pong machine in every bar, university, and street in America. Nolan started up his first company and decided to call it Atari. So why was the first video game invented in a small town in a valley in Northern California? To find the answer, I've come a few miles down the road to the Tech Museum in San Jose. When Nolan was dreaming about video games, this area around San Jose was at the center of the fastest growing industry in the world, the computer industry. It was here they invented the silicon chip and where, to this day, they produce over 80% of the world's supply. It became known as Silicon Valley. Silicon chips were revolutionary because, for the first time, it was possible to build a small computer that people could use at home. And, just down the road, lived a couple of techies who decided to do just that. This is the most famous garage in the world, a landmark site in computer history. Inside it, two teenagers built the world's first plug-in-and-go computer. They called their company Apple. Within 10 years, Apple were leading the world in personal computers. And those two teenagers, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, were bosses of a major multinational company. The Apple II was the machine that really kicked off the home computer. For a start, you didn't have to build it yourself. But more importantly, you could actually buy pre-written software for it. It was also the first colour home computer, because Steve Wozniak got sick and tired of playing his favourite game, Breakout, in black and white. Their next machine, the Apple III, was less successful. The assembly robots that constructed the circuit boards didn't push the chips firmly enough into their sockets. To help jiggle the chips back into position, Apple advised its customers to hold their computer 18 inches above a flat surface and let it drop. Very high tech. Today, the likes of Wozniak, Jobs and Bushnell are multi-millionaires, and the companies they started are massive, employing thousands of people. Computer and video games are now very big business, and the days of the adventurous lone techie building machines at home by torchlight are long gone. Kind of sad, really. Ah, a few watery eyes amongst the band if it was techies in the studio here. But if you're wondering what these little white things are... Then oh. here's a clue. This building is the home of Apple in America. These little white things are actually sculptures on their lawn of the icons you'd see if you used the Macintosh computer. There's the hand, for example. There's the paintbrush oh, look. Yeah, and I can just see the dog here in this corner. See, art and technology mix in San Francisco. Now, though, it's time for this week's news and previews. This week on CD-ROM is a sequel to last year's unusual PC hit, Magic Carpet. Guess what it's called? Yup, Magic Carpet 2. This time it's an evil character called Vizzler who threatens your world. 
Vizalath has trapped your old master in the underworld, and you must rescue him on your trusty carpet, as you do. Trying to stop you are seven of Vizalath's servants, each a powerful wizard. Blow your mind and your sanity with a new Mega Drive game out in November, Vector Man. The year is 2043, and Earth has become a toxic waste dump being cleared up by Orbots. Everything seems fine until the Orbot leader accidentally attaches an atomic bomb to his neural network, as you do. Now the Orbots are out of control, and only Vector Man, with his amazing morphing powers, can save what remains of the planet. If you've ever fancied strapping a helicopter to your back, as you do, then Blade Force on the 3DO is the game for you. You are part of a squad of airborne police who are fighting an evil street gang that has taken over the city. It's a shoot 'em up where you fly over enemy camps and blow them to bits before they do the same to you. Touching down in November. As you do. And now, here's Virtual Violet, still in historical mode, with a rundown on the development of the joypad. It's got original games. It's got arcade conversions. It's even got that funny platformer where you get to be a robotic rabbit. But one of the best things about the PlayStation has still got to be its joypad. OK, so it may not seem that significant, but history has shown that game controllers are more important than you might think. Ten years ago, when the NES appeared, it was a milestone in video gaming, not least because it popularised the joypad. OK, so it only had two buttons, but at least you no longer had to waggle away on one of these. The next advance in console history was the Mega Drive, and it just had to go one better. Oh, look, three buttons. Onwards to the SNES. More colourful graphics and a more colourful joypad with twice as many buttons. All essential for mastering sophisticated games. But it's not just the number of buttons, it's where you put them. There are 17 on the Jaguar, but you won't use the half of them, because the keypad is just so awkward to get to. So, as consoles move on, the controllers need to as well. The PlayStation joypad has got more buttons than you've got fingers, but they all seem to be in just the right place. And the future? Well, the prototype of the Ultra 64 shows four joypad ports, but no joypads. Nintendo say they're keeping the design for the joypads top secret because it's going to be as revolutionary as the Super Console itself. But don't keep your fingers crossed. You might need them. If you're a sad and lonely insomniac and you spend all your time playing Doom and you can finish all the levels blindfolded with one hand tied behind your back, then you need a new challenge. And we thought, wouldn't it be fun to play Doom on the Bad Influence set? Wouldn't it be fun? No, I'm on a computer, I'm on a computer! Oh, boring, Sonia. We created a level based on the Bad Influence set. And it's filled with digitised monsters of myself and Andy. And at the moment, they are crowding out the galley, so we're going to have to blast our way out of here just to get down to the studio. But yes, we've made it to the door. If you look in front, you can just see the video wall there. You can see the pods. To the left, there's the gantry. If we go round the gantry, I would be just about there on the platform. You can see the stairs behind me. Now, a level like that needs to have a plan, and this is the Bad Influence set map. Now, obviously, a complex map like this will take seven techies chained to empty pizza boxes several weeks to complete. So I'm going to make something a lot simpler using what's known as a Doom Editor. Now, what I've got here are basically three rooms which I can make into any size or shape that I wish. So if I just tap a corner here, I can pull this one out to create any different shape I want. Now, you want to see how that looks in the actual Doom set. This is what we end up with, our very basic couple of rooms. There's our rectangle there. We've got our little passageway, and then this is my triangular room at the bottom here. So how about I create a door? First of all, I have to isolate the area I want, and then if I just press automatic and door, I've created my door. And I want to make it a bit smaller. That's more like it. I want to change the carpet now in one of the rooms. I want to make it a bit brighter. There are hundreds of different styles and colours. I'll go for red. I want to put some stairs in. Right. I can put my staircase basically anywhere I want to go, so I'll put it in this top room here. Now I've got my decorations, I need to add some things like some monsters to fight against and some equipment to fight them with. And the beauty of this equipment is that you can just choose any kind of monster to fight against. Ah, we found a cacodemon, right. So I say I want to fight three, so I'll put three cacodemons in there. I need some weapons to defend myself when the door opens. Let's go for a weapon plasma rifle. That will do. And having got a plasma rifle, I need to have some energy cells. So let's see what it looks like now, actually, on the Doom levels. Right, so let me go and first of all get my gun. 
that. Now I need my ammunition, and I'm ready to go. So, here goes nothing. <laughs> Images are only available on PCs, but there are loads to choose from. You can even get them free on magazine cover discs. Right. Uh, um, and now for some more games review. <laughs> Complete the sequence. NHL 93, NHL 94, NHL 95. Yes, you've guessed it. National Hockey League 96 hits the Mega Drive this week. New options include spinning through 360 degrees while skating up the ice and sending in the bully boys to take out your opponent's star player. Is this game going to be a league winner? Here's Lisa. It's just another in the NHL series of ice hockey games. It's a playable sports sim, but nothing special. There are several gameplay modes, including playoffs, seasons and shootouts. I'm playing the regular game. The two teams are the Devils and the Red Wings. I'm playing the Red Wings and they're in white. It's quite easy to pass to you to each player, but it's sometimes hard to score a goal, which is quite frustrating. I'm using automatic goalie. This helps me to concentrate more on the gameplay. One of the good touches in the game is if you get really violent and decide to hit someone like in real life hockey, you get sent off into the sin bin. National Hockey League 96 has got a few new features, but the gameplay is not sufficiently different to NHL 95. I thought it was difficult to tackle your opponents and manoeuvre. Overall, it wasn't the best sports sim I've ever played. There's nothing I catch in that game. It's really average. And the scores for National Hockey League 96. Both the boys and the girls thought it was skating on thin ice and gave it an average three. It started life on the Amiga and PC, and now Space Hulk has lumbered onto the 3DO. In this doom like strategic shoot 'em up, you control the Blood Angel chapter of Imperial Space Marines. You keep track of your squad using the radar map in the corner of the screen. Your mission is to board the out-of-control Space Hulk and divert its course away from the Imperial planet Delvar III. The only hitch is an army of alien nasties which you have to destroy. Here's Lee. The graphics are spot on and the incredible atmosphere rarely keeps you in suspense, but the gameplay is too difficult. I have a squad of 10 men all wearing orange protective suits. I have to take control of them and position them on the map. Here are some of the aliens which you have to be killed to complete the mission. It's a very moody game and requires a lot of concentration to play, and it can be quite scary playing it alone in the house at night. Technically, it's a great game, but I found there wasn't enough time to position my men before the aliens got me. This game is really action-packed, and because of the first-person perspective and the sound effects, it makes you feel as if you're really there. They tried to put some very good ideas into this game, but unfortunately, it doesn't play that well. The scores then for Space Hulk, the boys gave it an average three, the girls liked it a bit more, a four. This week's competition prize is two PlayStations, each with a copy of Wipeout and a connecting lead. And the question is, what was the name of the very first video game? Was it A, Donkey Kong, B, Mud, or C, Computer Space? Phone in your answers on 0891 800 300. That's 0891 800 300. The lines are open until midnight on Sunday. Calls cost no more than 25 pence. And please make sure you get permission from whoever's paying the bill before dialing. Last week's competition prize was a Game Boy with Donkey Kong Land. And we asked you which computer game's character appeared in the original Donkey Kong. Well, the answer, as 8,500 of you knew, was Mario. And there he is, look. The lucky winner is Darren Hall from Waterloo, Bill and Hans. Congratulations, Darren. And ten runners-up will get Bad Influence, Bad Crew t-shirts. And your names are scrolling across the bottom of the screen now. Well done. No, no, no! Oh, yes! We were going to leave you with some Bad Influence Doom level, but then I thought, no, why not play the real Doom instead? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>